Hello and welcome to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. Yet another two-guest week here on the show. First, we'll continue the theme of catching up with coaches starting new jobs. This week, Marshall coach Charles Huff joins the show to talk about his path to Huntington, West Virginia, from his time with James Franklin at Vanderbilt and Penn State, a short stint in the NFL, worked in there, and a few years under Nick Saban at Alabama. Then Max Olson of The Athletic joins the show to talk about the big news in college football this week. Les Miles is out at Kansas following accusations of improper conduct toward women during his time at LSU. We'll get into how Kansas football got this bad and where it goes from here. Plus, Bob Stoops is back in college game as a TV analyst for Fox. Could that be a launching pad to Stoops getting back into coaching? Thanks for listening to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. You can find us on Westwood One Podcast, Apple Podcast, just about anywhere you like to get your podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a good review and a rating. It helps college football fans find us, and it helps us find more college football fans. If you'd like to email the show, send questions and comments to AP Top 25 Mailbag. That's AP Top 25, 25 the digits, mailbag at gmail.com. Joining me this week on the show is the new coach of Marshall. Charles Huff. Charles Huff, uh, interesting background, some time with Penn State, some time at Vanderbilt, some time with Nick Saban, little NFL time. Uh, Coach Huff, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, how is Huntington, West Virginia treating you? It's phenomenal. Um, I appreciate you having me on. Um, it's been a whirlwind, but it, it's been um, it's, it's been positive the entire time. The energy, enthusiasm, um, around Huntington and the surrounding communities and people's passion for Marshall football is starting to glow again. And obviously coming to hopefully a near end to the pandemic, people are excited about getting out, getting an opportunity to come gather back in the stadium, be around family and friends and cheer on the Marshall herd. So I've had a few coaches in the last few weeks on who have sort of stepped into new jobs. And and I didn't intend to do this with everyone, but I realize it's probably not a bad place to start. Uh, so I'll start in a question that I gave to the last two. And that, you know, you get hired for a job. So to a certain degree, you have to convince them to hire you. But to, but there's also a, a por- portion of this when in the hiring process, where as a, as a young coach who's got some opportunities and who's doing well in a job and is working in Alabama, you also have to assess whether it's a good move for you to take a head coaching job. You may want to be a head coach, but you also have to assess if that's the right head coaching job for you. So I'll ask you the same thing I asked Steve Sarkeesian, the same thing I asked, uh, you know, Clark Lee, who went to Vanderbilt. Why was this a good spot for you? Why did Marshall appeal to Charles Huff? Well, I think it goes back to any decision you make in life. You, you want it to be a win-win. You want it to be a win for you and your family, your personal career. Um, and you want it to be a win for, for the university on the other side. You know, and I think the history and tradition um, here at this university, here in this community, um, speaks volumes. And, and I think um, the energy and passion that the fans have for the football program and the university um, you know, really, really, you know, weighed on me in a positive manner, uh, for me to believe that it was going to be a positive step and that I could do some positive things here. Um, it, it's one of those things where, um, history does repeat itself and, and we learn from the past. Um, and, and they've had really good football programs in the past. Um, they stand on a really good foundation. Um, so it was, it was, a, it was a good, this easy decision for me. Um, because it was positive on both sides. You know, I wasn't stepping into a program that had never won or a program that was one and nine and needed a rebuild. Um, I was in a really good situation at um, Alabama. Um, we had just came off a national championship. So, you know, things were good there. And for me to take this opportunity, it had to be a win-win. And, and Marshall presented that for me. And um, I'm glad I presented that for them. 
Yeah, you're, as you said, not only does it have a history, a history of winning, but you're coming off of a pretty good year at Marshall. Uh, you know, whatever the reason the coaching change was made, it was not because the team failed. Um, had some tough spots late in the season, but it did not fail. So, you know, that's a great spot for, for, you know, a head coach as opposed to coming in and you go, wow, this roster needs a lot of work. Uh, as much as I know it, it, you can always get better and you have to put your touches on it and you will see spots where you think things can improve. Um, in your sort of first pass through looking at what you have to work with, uh, what did you see? Well, I think that was one of the decisions. You know, there, there are a lot of things. Um, that you have to deal with as a head coach. Um, those things are multiplied when you're a first time head coach. Um, and when you can kind of eliminate one of them being the current roster, um, makeover, you know, I, I think that helps, you know, when you, when you're coming in and you have talent, you know, at the end of the day, this game is one with talented football players. Um, so you got to have talent. And I think being able to come into a situation where they have, some key pieces in place really helps make the transition a little smoother. You know, obviously we got to continue to recruit well and we got to elevate um, the level of talent that we have and continue to get more. Um, but, you know, having a good foundation allows you to still have a chance to be successful while you're putting your touches on it, as you said, while you're adjusting the things, while you're making your schemes fit the players. Um, I think that helps a lot. Um, it helps a lot in recruiting when you are, um, already uh, convincing young men that, hey, we have a winning program here. You're going to come and take us to the next level. Um, I think that helps. I think it helps fans when you're talking about the things that you want to do and how you want to add to the success they've had. Um, I think it helps. I think it helps the entire picture. I, I want to talk a little bit about your path and, and getting into coaching uh, again, because you've had some certainly some very interesting stops, but after your college football career, I, I guess what I would ask is, when did you realize, yeah, coaching is definitely for me, that that's going to be something that I'm going to do to keep myself close to this game uh, if if the time on the field runs out, when the time on the field runs out? Yeah, I, I, I've always kind of had the, you know, I wanted to be a coach um, kind of burn inside of me since I was a kid. Um, but I really learned when I got to college and I started realizing how much work you had to do to get ready to play physically. Um, I did not like working out as a player. I worked out, but I was not a guy who loved going to the gym. I was always a little bit undersized and had to work a little bit harder to kind of be in the pack. And I realized that playing in the NFL at six, one and a half, 260 pounds, uh, playing O line was probably not in my cards. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, but I did want to stay around the game. I wanted to stay around the game because I love team atmosphere. I love a challenge. Um, I love the camaraderie um, of being on a team. Um, so I knew that's what I wanted to do. So obviously coaching uh, was something that, that, that fit that mold and still kind of filled that void that I had of wanting to be on a team and be in some kind of competitive uh, career. Um, and I was blessed enough to be in some situations where I got a chance to start coaching really early in my career. Um, there are a lot of other coaches who went into other sectors of the world, other jobs, and didn't realize, you know what, I want to coach. I was lucky enough to, as soon as I got done playing, I was able to jump into it and, and have kind of been in it ever since. You know, it's it's interesting. You, you talked about your playing career because, you know, I, I've we've met in person um, and I knew you played. But I didn't know until today, I was just checking out your bio, that you played offensive line. And again, you know, you're not a small guy by any chance. <laughs> but in meeting you in person, I was definitely not pegging for like Charles Huff center. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> that, that kind of caught me off guard a little, Charles. Yep. Yep. I, I was, I was definitely, uh, the runt of, of the litter when it came to the offensive line room when I played. Um, I was, was always the guy who struggled to kind of maintain weight. Now I'm on the other side. I'm struggling to try to get it off. Get it off. <laughs> That's age, man. Um, That's age. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I, I definitely, um, and I think playing O-line kind of helped me grasp the game a little bit because obviously playing center, um, I was required to know a little more, communicate a little more. Um, so it, it helped me as far as the knowledge of the game. 
to learn big picture, you know, and how the pieces kind of fit together. Um, it did not help me when it came to moving guys bigger than me. <laughs> um, but it, it allowed me to learn how to use the skills that I have or I had um, to be successful. And I've taken that kind of in my coaching career. You know, I'm not, I'm not the smartest. My last name is not Walsh or Lombardi. Um, but I, but I've used the skills, um, of kind of just working my way into great situations and, and, and learning how to, um, learn on the run, learning how to ask the right questions, learning how to see things from big picture perspective. When did you at what for the, the other thing too is I've always said the offensive line and offensive line coaches if you can get them to start talking and quite frankly offensive line coaches are usually pretty chatty offensive linemen however however tend not to be it's <laughs> odd it's almost like when they get out of playing then all of a sudden you can't keep, you can't keep them from talking um but but I have noticed that offensive line coaches are often like the most interesting guys on the on the field uh, or on the coaching staff that. That basis, as, as you sort of alluded to, of, of sort of understanding the offense through offensive line play, it seems important. I talk to coaches, and you see a lot of coaches who have offensive line backgrounds because it, it's sort of a gateway to everything else on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, did you find it to be that way, and maybe even a gateway to understanding defenses, even though you spent most of your career, you know, coaching on the offensive side of the ball? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we don't play a game that's seven on seven, you know, so when you just do the back end, um, things are, seem clear, um, but there's a component of, uh, of the blocking and the protection and the, the balance and understanding of gaps and understanding of flows of defense that you get a chance to see from the offensive line. I think also when you, when you coach the offensive line, um, that's the only position on the field where you're ultimately responsible for communicating, teaching, and showing five guys um, exactly what they need to do to work as a unit. You know, um, so I think what it does is it broadens your um, it broadens your view and your teaching knowledge on how the variety of people that you deal with in that room, how they learn, how they see things. Um, how you have to explain things, how you have to be transparent uh, with what you're trying to do. I think it creates a vehicle for you to be able to communicate with masses. And when I say masses, I'm talking about entire teams or entire groups. Um, a lot of times in other positions, you're coaching one, maybe two or three guys at a time on the field, and they're all kind of individually um, entrenched in their own lanes. Well, O-line, you're kind of all connected to a string, you know, and, and one person's communication and one person's thoughts and eyes really affects all five guys. Um, so I think once you once you live in that world for as long as I did, um, I think you, you see things differently. I think you communicate differently. Um, I think you're able to motivate differently. Um, you're talking about an offensive line group that you got to kind of get to feel really, really good about themselves and they may, may never hear the name called. Um, and, and in today's world, especially dealing with kids, um, immediate reaction or immediate feedback is, is what we all live on now. Um, so I think just the, the, the foundation and the fundamental blocks of coaching that position really sets you up to be successful coaching football in general. You, you spent one year in the NFL now. Yeah, the NFL is a rough year. It's a rough league. <laughs> and, and mm-hmm. you sometimes your choice to stay in the NFL is not really your choice, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in fact, coaching the coaching yep. business can be a lot of things where, where, where decisions are taken out of your hands. But it was one year at, with the Bills under Chan Gailey. And I'm just wondering what. Like what you learned about football that was so different, like what you learned from being in the NFL that was maybe eye opening compared to college and things that you, even though in that one year you were able to sort of take back to the college game. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a few things. I think one, whenever you get a chance to coach on the highest level, I think you have a greater respect from your players in college because you've been there. It's one thing to talk about, you know, hey, I know where you want to go and you got to do X, Y, and Z to get there. But it's another thing to say, well, I've been there and I know what you need to do to get there. Um, so from that perspective, I think I, I've, I've been able to have a um, slightly wider um, view on helping young men achieve their goals at the highest level. 
The second thing I would say is, as I learned from Chan Gailey, is you got to have a quarterback in this game. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how many, how good you are, it doesn't matter how good of a play you design. Um, the, 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 this game is run, and um, success in this game goes through the quarterback. Now, there are different types of quarterbacks, and there's different types of managing games that you can um, run through the quarterback, but you got to have a quarterback, and that's the biggest thing that from the NFL I've learned, you know, from a football X's and O's per, uh, perspective is you better find a quarterback and you better find one fast if you think you're going to have a chance to be successful. And as good as you may think you are, uh, without that quarterback or that trigger man, it's going to be very hard. Um, also, I, I got an opportunity to see, and I think we see it now with, um, I think it was Dak Prescott just signed a big deal and guys are making moves in the NFL preparing for the draft. You really see how much of a true business um, the NFL is versus college, which is more of a relationship oriented um, operation. Um, it is a true business in the NFL and it comes down to dollars. And that's really what it comes down to. How many good players can I sign for the amount of dollars that I have? And what is this player's value to the organization? Not is this player still a good player? Is this can this player help us win? What is his value? Uh, and I think when you look at the two, that's the biggest difference. You know, the NFL is a true business. It does come down to financial decisions and economic decisions. Um, and college is a little bit more, although college um, is a very lucrative operation, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bit more relationship oriented. You know, you, you kind of build relationships through recruiting, you build relationships through the community, you build relationships on your campus. Um, and, and that's where a lot of your success and, and enthusiasm and energy behind your operation comes from relationships. Um, so those, those things to me were the eye opening pieces of where I learned, okay, this is the NFL and this is college. So I, I, I almost hate to, you know, single out one or two coaches that you work for because you work for a lot of them. And I am assume you have influences from all over, but you spent a lot of time with James Franklin. I think that's the most time you spent with any head coach. And obviously yep. you, you worked for Nick Saban and, you know, he's pretty good. <laughs> and, 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 Alabama, okay. yeah. And being around that Alabama system is, is something that is, has been beneficial to a lot of coaches. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I would I would ask you, you know, what influences did you take from those two sort of, you know, those two guys from being around James Franklin for such a long time and the way he runs and develops a program and the few years that you were at very successful years of uh, almost like finishing school, right, with Alabama yeah, and Tuscaloosa. Yeah. I, I call it, they call it doctor school, doctor's level, uh, uh, football and coaching. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? The, the beauty of it is I, I, I have worked with both of those guys and, and what I, what I've actually learned is, um, I am a melting pot of my experience. So, um, working with James Franklin, I learned the, uh, premium on being organized and being very detailed. Um, be very organized in your approach, be very detailed in your message, um, make it very clear what you want everybody in the organization to do, map it out, um, and everything matters when it comes to detail. It's detail in, you know, the, the, the chairs in your office, the detail in the, in the colors on your paper, the details in your playbook, um, the details on the field with the players. Um, you know, so from, from that perspective, that's the one thing I take to James and from coach Saban, uh, you know, although we could, we could do this interview for, for seven hours, mm -hmm. but the, the one thing that I, that I, that I take and hold strong to is a consistency in approach, um, consistency in message, consistency in scheduling, consistency in approach with the players, consistency in approach, um, with, with your staff. Um, you know, set the expectation and hold everyone accountable. And, and, and those two things I've kind of blended together and, and are kind of the foundation that I'm standing on. Try to be very detailed in everything we do here. Try to be very uh, organized in everything we do and then try to be as consistent as I can and, and trying to get that message to the players um, that the details matter. It all matters. Um, the way you tuck your shirt in matters. The way you walk in the building matters. Um, consistency and approach doesn't matter if we're playing 
the first game of the year, the last game of the year. It doesn't matter if we're playing, quote unquote, a rival or we're playing, you know, quote unquote, you know, the game that really doesn't matter. It all matters. Every play, um, you know, is a, is a play in a life of its own. And getting them to approach each day with that same consistency, hopefully, will 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 you know deliver what you know you see at Alabama, which has been years and years and years of consistency. I think if you literally look at Alabama, the dominance over time is what's the most impressive. You know, we've we've all been in this business a long time, and we've seen you know programs hit highs, and programs hit lows, and you know some programs are kind of on a roller coaster, but. The one thing that you can say about the Alabama football program is the consistency over time. Um, and I think that comes from Coach Saban's consistent approach day, day in, day out. Yeah, it is, uh, it is remarkable and it is unprecedented. So I, I want to, I, I was looking at your, your Twitter timeline today and I noticed, um, uh, great Marshall coach, former Marshall coach Bob Pruitt sort of popped by mm-hmm. the, popped by the office, so to speak. Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. He stopped by today. Um, obviously, it's always great to to, to have um, former legends or former uh, successful coaches and people, you know, in the program come by. And he was he's in town taking care of some personal matters, and he stopped by and he said he was going to be here five minutes, and he was here an hour and a half sitting in a defensive meeting, just talking ball. And you know, I, obviously, when we all you know hang up the the whistles and kind of get out of it, we take a deep breath, but we also miss it, you know. So. Him getting back and a chance to be around the guys that he coached, uh, Ralph Street, Shannon Morrison, um, getting a chance to sit in the defensive meeting and talk a little ball and listen to a little ball. Um, you know, you, you could see a smile on his face. He had kind of a, a kid in the candy store glow and, uh, it, it was good. You know, we, we picked up some things from him and, you know, he just kind of reminisced on some of his time here and talked to us a little bit about, um, you know, what he's learned and what he's kind of, thought about over the years while he's been away from the game and uh, hopefully he gets back you know he's here for a couple days hopefully he gets back because it was good for us I know it was good for him so I know you don't need to have ties to a program ties to an area to be successful as a coach in that area just as you know Nick Nick Saban has no ties to Alabama but he's done all right at (laughs) Alabama Uh, and, and, and that's not and that's sort of the case with you with West Virginia but it also helps if you I guess you have to sort of learn those things, right? You have to understand the area mm-hmm. and the people and the history of the program and, and not to mention the current status of high school ball in the state and the connections with high yeah. schools and things like that. So how have you got about creating some of those connections and learning about Marshall to, to make up for the fact that you don't have ties there? Yeah, well, I, I think it goes back to relationships. I think you got to surround yourself with people um, that complement you, and you got to set an infrastructure um, to cover all those bases. You know, so one of the things that was really important to me um, was to, to hire some guys who had some Marshall and West Virginia connections. Um, I, I think that that helps me, um, like you say, kind of learn on the run. Um, that helps me kind of avoid some pitfalls. Um, I think that that's important. I think the other thing is you got to be open. You got to be open to learning. You got to be open and listening um, about the things that, you know, make Marshall or whatever university you may be at, what makes it tick, you know, what makes it strong, you know, looking back in the past, what what they do in the past that, you know, created some of the the memories and traditions that we we know we have here. Um, So, so being able to do that has kind of helped me expedite the, learning curve. Um, obviously, you know, when you coach, you, you, you bounce around the country and you recruit a lot of different areas, but there's still something said about, you know, having someone around you who played it, lived it, breathed it, or were born in it. Um, and, and that's what I was able to do. You know, I hired five guys on my staff at some capacity that have, um, you know, Marshall or West Virginia ties. And then I hired two off the field guys who, who have, um, Marshall ties, you know, who have played here and went on and done great things in their career and want to come back. So I think it's a unique balance between surrounding yourself with the right infrastructure and, and being open and willing to develop the relationships to learn, you know, and then finding that, that, that balance between, okay, this is what Marshall, uh, is and stands for. This is what the state of West Virginia and the surrounding areas stands for. And this is who I am and blending those two together. Um, to make a successful product. All right. Last one for you is 
Um, you were, I believe, the only African American head coach hired this past cycle. And there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, led by guys like Alonzo Carter from, uh, assistant coach at San Jose State, who's putting Zooms together for African American coaches to sort of get to know each other, network a little bit, learn and listen, as he, as he puts it. And Mike Loxley has put together a, a coalition in a way to, as a way to do some things to, Speed up that progress, right? To help more yep. African American coaches get to the position where you got. If I came to you and said, "Okay, you share your experiences," what were some of the things you know that that helped you get to where you're going? And that you can share that may be a little more specific to with the with a little more specific to the needs of African American coaches. Yeah, I, I I think all of those initiatives. Uh, what, what Coach Loxley's doing with the coalition, what um, Coach Carter's doing with, with the Zooms and educating and, and uh, creating a, a different experience. I think all of those things are helpful <clears throat> because it, it's a two-part deal. Obviously, we as minority head coaches and coaches in general, I think everyone has to continue to research and enhance their knowledge so that when opportunities come, they are the most prepared and they can be successful. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, it, it really comes down to what, what's, you know, what helped me get this job. It's the relationships. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of initiatives and we're doing a lot of things to try and enhance those things, but it really comes down to, um, the people who make the decisions at the college level. Yes, you have your ADs. Yes, you have your search firms. Yes, you have your presidents. Yes, you have your board members. But ultimately, the people who enhance or um, what's the best word? The people who the sway the decision yeah. the most mm -hmm. in most scenarios. And I'm talking general terms here. I'm not generalizing everybody into one specific box. But generally, the people who make those decisions or weigh the most on those decisions are the people who donate the most money. Mm -hmm. The issue is the people who donate the most money are rarely connected to um, minorities. In this case, they're rarely connected to necessarily the best candidate. Um, they're rarely connected to what people would consider, um, you know, the hot names or, or, or people that should, quote unquote, get jobs. They're connected to their circle. Mm -hmm. Their circle usually entails these these people who donate the money are usually um, uh, older gentlemen or older females who have generated a lot of wealth and can donate back to a school. And their connections are the people they know. Mm -hmm. And the people they know are either these uh, the hot coordinators who have uh, made you know a name for themselves on a large scale or their connections. Someone they know, a friend of a friend, um, a friend of a coach, or a friend of whoever it may be, and those are the people that they push. So it puts the athletic directors and the presidents and the search firms in a tough spot. Here we run a search, and we have found that candidate X is the best candidate, and we're really interested in the best candidate. But donor A, who donates twenty, thirty, forty, fifty million dollars to the school every year wants us to hire candidate B. Mm -hmm. Well, it puts them in a tough spot because we all know um, colleges and universities uh, are, are always looking to enhance revenue and they need the support of their donors. So it makes it very difficult for the ADs, the search firms, and the presidents to hire whatever may be considered the best candidate if that candidate is not being pushed by the donors and the people who donate. Yeah. Um, so well, what's the solution to that? Um, I think the solution is we have got to get more uh, recognition and more relationships with the people who are making the ultimate decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you do that? Well, we got to do, we got to get more involvement, um, with the, the, the donors and the boosters by minority coaches and, and female coaches as well in other sports. We got to get more exposure so that they feel more comfortable that although I'm donating $20 million, I'm willing to get to know 
um, this candidate that you feel is the best candidate. Um, and I think that's where in college football, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the people who are donating the money very rarely have the exposure to, you know, what people would consider the best candidates or minority candidates or a candidate that's named that may not be, um, you know, the hot name because they just won a national championship as an offensive or defensive coordinator yeah. or may not be the best candidate because their name is not, you know, a former head coach who's coached at such and such and such. Um, so I think that's a little bit of where we are right now. Um, and, and, you know, how we cross that bridge or how we close that gap is, is what I think Coach Loxley and other um, initiatives are trying to do. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it's 100% race-driven. Um, is there a race component? Yeah, because once again, if you don't know um, another candidate, race, creed, whatever it may be, then yeah, that blocks some of the, the avenues. Um, but I think it really comes down to the relationships and the knowing by the people who are ultimately making these decisions. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how it works out. And again, I, having talked with Coach Loxley about, you know, actions, it, it, again, we can all sort of theorize and put out ideas. And there's been a lot of that over the years. And maybe yep. you talk about it and you complain about it. But at some point, like people have to do things and people like Mike Loxley, again, in position to be able to have, have a little power and some and some sway uh, being in position to actually do things, I think, um, should hopefully make a difference. Uh, Charles yes. Huff is the new coach at Marshall. Um, it should be an interesting match there, Charles. I hope you, uh, enjoy your time, um, getting to know Huntington, West Virginia. I know as a new coach, sometimes it's hard to even do that. Have you like had a chance to buy a house? Is your family there I, yet? I, I actually, that stuff. <laughs> um, I actually just, um, kind of finalized and set a closing date on the house. Uh, my family is planning to, to be here in Huntington permanently uh, the 1st of April. Great. Uh, we're finalizing everything in Tuscaloosa and looking forward to the move. And um, Huntington has been great. The reception's been great. I've probably put on 10 pounds eating <laughs> at all the restaurants and all the great um, food spots around and shaking hands. And um, It's been phenomenal. It really has. It's, it's, been, it's been a whirlwind, but it's been, I mean, more than what I could have dreamed of. And, and obviously we got a lot of work to do because at some point the parade is going to end and the evaluation on wins and losses will start. Uh, but it, it's been a great start. Excellent. Well, again, Charles, thanks you so much for taking a little time today to get us up to speed on what's going on down there at Huntington. And good luck with Marshall and all that you have to get done, uh, especially getting that house all, all, set, all set up and squared away. Awesome, buddy. Well, I appreciate you and anything I can do to help. You're always welcome here in Huntington and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon, buddy. Hey, all podcast consumers, Rich Eisen here. So often, aspiration comes from inspiration, with titans of industry being those torchbearers. With guests from the world of news, business, sports, and entertainment, my new show is going to give you their most in-depth firsthand stories that focuses on the humble beginnings and humbling moments that we can relate to in our own lives. The podcast is called Just Getting Started with me, Rich Eisen. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. Joining me this week on the podcast, Max Olson from The Athletic. Does a great job of covering college football from a national perspective, but also ha always has great insight on that Big 12 area because that's where Max has done most of his living. Uh, and uh, congratu And Max has been a little out of the loop, a little bit, a little bit out of the loop because, hey, there's a yeah. new there's a new Olson uh, that has arrived. Welcome, Theo Olson, uh, the new addition to the Olson family. Well, that's that's very kind of you. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been a little weird to, you know, take I'm taking a little leave here, which has been great. I, I told myself I would, uh, you know, kind of log off Twitter, you know, stop tweeting during this time too. these these two months I'm taking off here. But you know what, Ralph, uh, Les Miles just just pulls me right back in. You know, this is this is what happens sometimes in this sport. Well, that's what, and that's why I wanted to have Max on. Cause again, Max, is, he covers the sport nationally and does a great job, but he definitely has a pretty keen insight on 
the Big 12 area and so sort of that Midwest footprint. Um, and I also wanted to get your national perspective on miles. So you have some local perspective and some national perspective and of national writers. I don't know if anybody's done a better job of sort of looking into how Kansas got here. So uh, I, I do want to talk about, well, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Let's, I know it's like where do you start in terms of like unpacking everything that's gone wrong at Kansas? Yeah, you know? I think I think we have to start with the news because I do think that if we get into how Kansas got here, we could that could just take forever, <laughs> and we won't really get yeah, a chance to right. touch on less. But were you? Again, knowing that you weren't necessarily covering it day by day because you, you've been, you've luckily been away, uh, but less kind of drags you back in, at least to be interested in what's going on. That's, you know, it's a, yet another off season coaching move. We seem to have one of these every year. Um, less is that one. Uh, were you s- surprised at all that Kansas cut ties with less? Did you think there was any way that maybe, that administration and Jeff Long looked at it and said, you know what? I, I think we can ride this out. No, I, I, yeah, I just don't think, um, I think the seriousness of, of what came out, um, you know, last week on the LSU side of things about less miles and, um, you know, just frankly, any, any talk about, you know, him being banned from being in one-on-one settings with college students, I'm not really sure how you can move forward as a coach and, and kind of overcome, uh, this deal and, and, and also just the fact that, uh, you know, now I, I, I don't know to what extent Jeff Long in Kansas looked into this or looked into Les Miles' behavior at, at Kansas over the last few days here. They did put him on administrative leave to say they were going to look into it and then, you know, then made this move or, or made this deal, I guess, for him to move on. Um, but I, I, I think, I think it, it became pretty clear, um, as this, as this stuff became public, um, that there was kind of no moving forward and, I, I guess we don't really totally know what Kansas was aware of, um, you know, in hiring him, but, but clearly I don't, I don't think they were not probably not very much. And, and um, you know, to me that I think it is fair of everybody to sort of question, well, who should be making this hire? Because clearly the last hire was, uh, was rushed. It was, it was kind of a, a I would say a sham of a coaching search uh, where there was one, one target that they locked in on uh, from the day they fired David Beatty. And then, they went and hit the road to visit a couple other people, but it was always going to be less miles. And, uh, you know, how do you, how do you not do all, all of that due diligence and, and find out this kind of stuff? If you only have one target, uh, I, I don't totally know, but it just seemed like there was, there was a point of no return here. I also think that coming out in the report, the idea that, um, you know, some of the maybe more egregious allegations against miles, from individual um, student workers, female student workers, there was yeah. some pushback on, you know, what exactly happened there, which ale- essentially led to him being cleared. And when I say cleared in the first report, the one that was done in 2013, it was sort of like, well, there was no, there was nothing, certainly nothing criminal here. There were some conflicting reports. So sort of cleared of wrongdoing. In a sense that it it, it became, it, it it seems to me my yeah reading, it's like kind of you're neither innocent nor guilty I guess yeah right? my reading that of that yeah my reading of cleared of wrongdoing is you didn't do anything criminal and we probably can't fire you for cause um, right related directly to these that's actions the, right that's the bottom line is they they couldn't they felt that they could not. I mean, even, even as Joe Oliva was recommending moving on from Les Miles, clearly they uh, felt that they they didn't really have the means to to you know totally get out of that deal. Now it's sort of baffling that he survives three more years after that, but uh, clearly the, this was enough for them to think very seriously about uh, whether he was fit to be their head coach, even at a time when LSU was really successful. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that made it clear to me that he probably wouldn't survive because when you have an AD at the previous school, and again, they didn't act on it. So you can say, well, somebody there obviously supported less. But when you have the AD at the last school saying, no, we we should fire this guy. And also some of the other things about culture of the 
program and the things that he wanted with this with the female student workers and how they should look and things along those lines like there was not a lot of pushback against that in those reports that was made fairly clear that that stuff was going on so even that alone was probably enough uh to get him fired but again i think the fact that it came out that joe aliba pushed for him to be fired and he was not at a time when lsu was really successful now that shouldn't matter but we all know it does and then now you have those type of allegations against a 67 year old coach who's just coming off a winless season at the worst program (laughs) and who's was hired because he was buddies with the ad and by the way we're not sure if we love that ad anymore there was just like Again, it should be a, a, one of those things where like, well, what's the right thing to do? But we know it never comes down to just what's the right thing to do. There's all these other factors and all those other factors weren't play, helping less in this situation either. No, and, and the statement from uh, Jeff Long late Monday night, um, I, 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 I think Good probably grief. struck a lot of people as odd um, to say, you know, we need to win games. We're going to go get someone to win games. It's like, clearly that's not the only reason this is going down, but Hey, maybe, maybe there is some sort of uh deal. They were able to strike there where, you know, less moves on for some reduced payout and, and they all sort of keep quiet and go their separate ways. I, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine that's the case that they weren't looking to disparage there, but clearly this was not, not just about wins and losses as, as much as, uh, the results through through two seasons at Kansas are pretty damning them by themselves. So it's interesting because the less miles higher, I don't think a lot of people thought that that was going to work out. But there's a lot of hires in college football that people go, mm, not so sure about that. And they work pretty well. And then there are others where we go, wow, that should be great. And then, you know, it turns out to be Tom Herman at Texas. Um or Willie Taggart at Florida State, or, or Chad yep. Morris at, yep. at Arkansas, even like the worst case scenario, right? So we've we've come to the conclusion pretty strongly that we don't really know what we're talking about, right? When it comes to who's <laughs> going to be good, we're just guessing. But I must admit, with less, very few people were were less than well, no pun intended. Very few people were optimistic, and it turns out, like you kind of looked at it and thought, like, well. It's he's a big name and he's got experience. What's the worst that could happen? And it turns out it was actually worse than we thought. <laughs> like only Kansas could like say, well, let's give this a chance. How bad could it be? And it actually turns out to be worse than we thought it could be. It, it, it's tip- it, it like nothing sums up Kansas better than that. How bad can it be? Well, oh, that bad. Yeah. Well, you know, remember, so you think back two years ago. Um, you know, Les Miles gets Kansas at pretty much the same time that that Mac Brown also comes back and takes over North Carolina, right? And and the and the distinct difference there. Look, there's obviously a huge talent and infrastructure and different, you know, AD and all all these differences, right? But the distinct difference to me is Mac Brown was a man with a plan and and he knew how to be successful at North Carolina. He'd done it before. You come in with a blueprint. You know, hey, obviously we're we're at a little bit of a rock bottom moment here, but I know exactly what to do to turn this around. And frankly, Ralph, I I don't know that you could really look at the way Les Miles approached the Kansas job and say that there was like a, a super uh, coherent, sharp plan in in how to how to go about this. I mean, he you know he hired Les Kenning as his OC, which I had heard at the time was because Les kind of wanted to have Les Miles wanted to have kind of control of the offense. And he fired him after six games in the middle of year one and and switched to, uh, oh, oh, OK, I guess I will reluctantly become, uh, you know, a, a head coach of a, a offense that goes all in on RPOs. Um, and and that total I mean, and and I, I thought Brett Dearman, who they picked for that was did a solid job to finish out 19, but it just totally went off a cliff in 20. Um, I think the other thing that was obvious from the very start is. I think we can agree LSU is one of the most advantaged programs in the country when it comes to uh, the talent pool in your state and the ability to, you know, get blue chip recruits uh, in your program year after year. And Kansas is is probably the most disadvantaged or, or, or you know, uh, pro- probably among at least among power five, the most disadvantaged program in terms of getting good players to come to your program. So when you are are making that big of a change after you haven't been in coaching for many years. Um, like, how are you going to get good players to Kansas and turn it around? And, uh, even in that ap- approach, like they refused to take transfers, um, uh, because they thought 
uh, transfers equals bad because of uh, Charlie Weiss and David Beatty. And so, you know, they 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 he, he, they upgraded the recruiting staff and stuff like that. And that and those folks worked hard to try and get better players at Kansas. But they just put a ton of freshmen on the field last year and, and got killed because that's what happens when you refuse to take transfers and Juco players at a time when the portal is as hot as it is. Like it just it didn't really make a ton of sense to me the way they went about it. And, um, you know, I, I think you saw uh, they were just incredibly overmatched in 2020. Yeah, I think it, it's also good to remember that when Les was fired, after Les was fired at LSU, he was aggressively trying to get back into the game, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like there was yep. no like, oh, I'm going to sit this out. Whereas, you know, a guy like Mac Brown, when he was fired at Texas, had opportunities to get back in at sort of lower level jobs and decided, you know what, I, I think I'm going to sit this out for a while. And it, it speaks volumes to the fact that less with his resume coming off of a firing that in, at the time almost seemed unfair, right? Because he, he was only a two and two start. He had been winning pretty big that there wasn't yeah, a sure. line for less, that there wasn't many people knocking down that door. And essentially all he could get was Kansas. So you're right. He comes in there. He doesn't necessarily have a good plan. Immediately, there's like there, there there's. This I think red- the plan was I'm less miles. Yeah, you know the, what I mean? the red like, flags all over the that's, place. That's how yeah. I think Jeff Long treated it too. Was the plan is he's less miles, and that's going to help us generate money, and we right. need money right. to. It was, it was a booster uh, play, build up right? a better su- support staff, and 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 to you know their facilities project upgrade their stadium was kind of put on hold at that time too because they they're like look we need a real infusion of of uh, donations and interest in, in Kansas football. And, and they even, you know, they sign up for, you know, the ESPN plus reality show and all that. Like, I think clearly it was the, you know, step one was try to use less miles celebrity um, as, as, as kind of the thing that would get them moving. But I don't know that, uh, you know, being the guy in, in the Dos Equis commercials is, is really like a thing that you can build your program around, you know? <laughs> um so I, mean, he, I think he, I believe he also wore his national title rings like on the field during game. So like they tried, they tried whatever they could to like remind people this is Les Miles. He's won it all. Uh, come play for him. And I'm and I know some recruits did respond well to to you know get to meet with him and got a kick out of that and stuff. But it just you know that can't be like the only thing you have going for you, right? You know, last week I had Stephen Godfrey on the show from Banner Society. And we had a really long, probably a little too long conversation. <laughs> it's a very long podcast about um, underachieving programs. And mm-hmm. we brought up, we went conference by conference. And when the Big 12 came up, I, I assumed he was going to say Texas because that's, you know, why not? Everybody's going to sort of pound on Texas for being an underachiever. And he actually said Kansas and convinced me that Kansas should be it. Not because listen, Kansas is, is doesn't have a history of, of of success, but it leads to this question, Max. How did Kansas get this bad? They had a, a, a an under two hundred winning percentage for the decade of the twenty tens. Like I know Kansas is has never been a football powerhouse, and it has its you know moments here or there where it is singularly interesting or or mediocre, but. This has become sort of historic level terribleness, yep. and yep. you, you got to do some work to get there. So again, that this could be a very long answer, but if you can give me the Reader's Digest version of how did the hole become this deep? Well, and and especially in this sport, like what's so bizarre is you know the the like they hit the peak right before the the absolutely you know rapid descent right like they go to they go to the orange bowl like they had you know with mark mangino like they they turned kansas into uh, a super competitive big 12 team that can uh you know now this was a different era of the big 12 obviously life was easier when you were just having to try to conquer the big 12 north you know but still like they, they 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 were in really good shape uh you would think going into uh, you know, the end of that decade after after what they'd built up there under Mangino and, you know, t- to be 18 and 99 um, over the last 10 seasons and five and 84 against Big 12 teams. 
um, is is truly it's truly insane. And and I I, don't, I guess maybe we should start here, Ralph. Like when when you look across the country at, at how these how, how you know this this stuff is t- typically pretty cyclical. Um, you know, you, you fail, you replace that coach with a better coach. Generally you try and get back, back on, you know, back to, to 500 and, and then up from there or whatever. I mean, how many programs can really say they have failed on four straight head coaching hires? It, it's yeah, that's remarkable because at a certain level, like I, I think a good example is like Shiano at Rutgers last year, right? At a certain point, a program sort of hits its nadir and then you mm-hmm. find, you know, at a certain point, you will find a coach who has the ability to just bring like m- bare minimum competency back. Yeah. And that alone will get you to maybe a four win season. You know, today's right. schedules, you know, you schedule three relatively easy games out of conference and maybe, oh, wow, we stumbled into a bowl game because we have a senior quarterback. And, you know, maybe we still go back to stinky. Like, like even the, the bad programs are nothing like what Kansas has hit. If you look at the hits, the last 10 years or so of Rutgers, the last 10 years or so of Vandy, the last 10 years or so of Illinois. These are all pro- programs that have struggled mightily, but nothing is like this. So, yeah, like well, and a, a look, string like no of one incompetency. In Kansas is saying like, "Hey, I think we can be an eight-win program." Like they're just trying to get to six, man. Like that. Like this is not. They're just trying to get. To we're four. not asking for they, like a ton here. These are not insane ambitions. Yeah. It's you, you know, you just need to like schedule easy non-conference, go three and zero in that, and then try and like steal two Big Twelve wins. And and maybe you steal another one and get close to six, right? Like that's that's like all they're aiming for at this point, just to get out of this hole. And that's what's like kind of, you know, and they're and they're just not even close. Like the average score in conference play for them this year was forty seven to fifteen. Like it, it's they're not even anywhere close. And and you know this this twenty twenty team was only slightly better than David Beatty's zero and twelve team in twenty fifteen. Like if you go by scoring margin per game, they've had the two most overmatched power five teams of the last decade i mean so it's like we're you you know you're just trying to get to like four wins would be awesome progress five wins would be would be huge right like it's not it's not like uh we're trying to talk about kansas becoming a contender again like you just need to get to you know to 500 somehow and it's going to take many years to get there now um so when you look at sort of all the, there's a lot of villains and well, villains, villains is probably a little harsh word though. Less may have earned it. Uh, and so Jeff Long, but, but if you look at all the people who are sort of responsible for where they are, is it possible? You know, it's, it's hard not to go back to Charlie Weiss and, and his sort of JUCO strategy. And again, like I can understand Kansas's aversion to JUCOs because Charlie Weiss turned it into a JUCO for a couple of years there and it totally screwed up their numbers and. It um, it left them in a massive scholarship hole that they are, I think, still digging out of. Um, it, it, is it fair to lay, a, you know, who, like who's who's public enemy number one, who's most accountable, who's most uh, um, responsible for all this? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, I, I've done some reporting about just how Kansas got into um, this this scholarship debt that they have where, um, you know, by the time David Beatty took over the program, they had 68 true scholarship players out of out of 85. Um, they were able to get that up to to 77 at one point during his tenure, but but never, never back into the 80s. Um, and and a lot of that goes to, yeah, Charlie Weiss uh, sort of trying to copy the Bill Snyder model a little bit, thinking, hey, let's get. Let's get transfers and JUCOs in here that will will just make them better and just 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 sort of give them a short term bump to you know get back to being a six win kind of program that that then you, it might make your program more attractive to recruits um, and give you a chance to kind of sort of build from there and that just totally failed. But I, I I'm I'm well aware there's also a, a lot of Kansas fans who um, you know as they see it point to Beatty as being just as bad as Weiss in terms of. Um, just the 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 results. Uh, I I think David Beatty had a had a, a a blueprint of how to try and fix it, um, but it is just climbing out of that is a very complicated problem um, because uh, you know you need to have a long runway, and you know when he took the job he he was 
I think committed to to building with high school players and trying to, you know, you, you want four year players instead of two year players. But <laughs> at the same time, after a couple of years, uh, you know, you you have all this pressure on you and you have an AD change. And what are you going to do? Like you, you have to bring in players that's going to make your team better just so you can buy yourself more time to stick to your plan. And so he he went back to the JC route a little bit. Now his his were more, you know, full qualifiers and not guys that Weiss took that that had no chance, but um but it still leaves kind of the same result now that um you know, it's and and, and interestingly Ralph, um you would think when you have this scholarship debt and you can't get back to 85 and you're dealing with this like no other program in the country, you would think that the eligible freeze is the greatest miracle to ever happen to your roster building problem right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but um this offseason kansas has had 15 scholarship players go in the transfer portal 10 of them being grad transfers so like i i they may get a lot closer to 85 because of this freeze uh next year and in the years ahead but at the same time they've also like not been able, you know they're still going to have a pretty young team in 21 even with that that freebie that they're being given that uh, should help them get back to normal. So it's it's just a kind of a, a crazy mess. And 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 the longer you lose, like they have, um, the harder it is for for talented high school recruits to to want to go to Kansas. Yeah, because now you're not. You can say, well, we recruited better, but you may break all those kids before you see them develop. Right. Yeah. If you're just shoveling them in there to be run over. Yeah. I mean, you've, yeah, recru- you, you've you play recru- a ton of freshmen yeah. and those guys, you know, what, what happens to them? Well, their, their development gets screwed up because they're playing too soon before they're physically ready. You know, you're playing linemen as freshmen who then get injuries that, that sort of, uh, throws them off course for the rest of their career. Like it, it really kind of can ruin the young players on your roster if you have to play too many of them. And, and that's what they had to do. Um, at, at times under Beatty and, and certainly in 2020. Yeah, because you can say, well, they recruited better. I think they may have had like the sixth or seventh best class in the Big 12. But understand yeah. something. The sixth or seventh best class in the Big 12 does not mean you have a bunch of guys who are ready to play as freshmen. That right. just means you have a bunch of guys with nice developmental ceilings. And maybe you have a handful who you feel confident that given some playing time and some smaller roles, and maybe you find one or two that you think, oh, yeah, that could be a starter. Maybe not ideally. But for us, he could be a starter. But if you're just, you know, if you're pouring that freshman class, and again, that's this year's class. So let's say if they're just like throwing, you know, most of those, whoever's the coach is throwing most of those guys into the fire because he has nothing else to do. Again, the uh, the sixth best class in the Big 12 is still a developmental class. Right. It is. You're you're absolutely right about that. And and also, you just think about if 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 you were in their position of of being a Kansas football player, um, and and all the hard work you put in for twelve months, um, and and the results keep being the same, and you have sort of incompetent coaching and all this all these problems that that show up on game day and stuff, like I imagine that gets pretty miserable, you know, and 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 especially at a time right now where you know if if one time transfer exception gets passed, like it's just going to be easy to move on and say, hey, I shouldn't be I shouldn't be here. This is this is a mess and I, I'm not going to be the one that fixes it. Right. So like I, I, to, to all the Kansas players over the last decade that have stuck it out and stayed four or five years, like you have to tip that you're captain them because they've, they've put in the work for this like really hopeless thing that um, I'm, I'm sure is not fun. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, there you look at them this season, Kansas's offense um, only held a lead for 23 snaps all season. Oh my Lord. Like they only took a lead in two games. <laughs> And they only reached the red zone 18 times in nine games. So like it's, you know, it's like, and, and their defense, you know, had problems too. Certainly I'm not trying to just single out the offense, but I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. It, it is, it is a, you know, now I don't follow soccer a ton, Ralph. I'm, I'm guessing you do more than I do. So I don't really know how that world works, but like, wouldn't this be a very logical choice for, uh, a candidate for for relegation at some point, <laughs> or a Ted Lasso hire? Or do you watch that right. show? Like, like yeah. maybe maybe hey, he, he came from Wichita State. You know, maybe one of those guys is in their backyard. You know, you um, well, you could do a Ted Lasso in reverse, right? You could um, uh, you could maybe hire a soccer coach to coach the football team as opposed to sure. a football coach to coach the soccer team, and just see how that works out. Which leads me. To, to this, um, 
you know, it, we're we're less than 24 hours away from the move being made at almost 11 o'clock Eastern time uh, on a on a Monday night. Uh, so thanks, Kansas, for that as well. Um, so it, what this coaching search is going to look like is hard to tell. You have an AD who clearly will be on shaky ground. I don't even know if they've hired a search firm yet. So who exactly is making this hire? Um right. And that always influences not just who you look for because, hey, the, that AD may have connections to certain people, though that didn't work out last time because the connection was to less miles, a very close connection to less miles. But also it influences how the job will be perceived by the candidates. If, if the candidate thinks, hey, AD, you're, you're a short timer. Like, why am I talking to you? Or who am I exactly am I talking to? Who is the, the leader in this room? That influences who might take the job. However, a lot of the same names have sort of a lot of the names that you think might come up have come up. I don't even know. You can give me a name. You can give me names if you want. But I, I guess I would wonder, like, if I just gave you like, what's the ideal? What's the idea for a Kansas coach that maybe makes sense to you? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And I think it's probably worth pointing out to start. Um you know, it is, it is March um, and teams are already going through spring ball and stuff. So I, I guess there, I, you do like have to wonder, like you think back to, um, you know, Ohio state after Trestle or Baylor after Bryles or Arkansas after Petrino, which was Jeff Long. Like, you know, there, obviously there is a little bit of history of, do you go the interim route here for the, for the rest of the year? Um, and, you know, probably be pretty bad in 21, but at least have a chance to go through a, a full, full coaching search especially if they make an AD change. Um, I do wonder about that. We obviously also saw in this cycle, Tennessee, you know, go out and and do the AD search and knock it out in a week and then go, go hire a football coach. Right. So like, I, I, I am curious sort of uh, how Kansas moves forward here just in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, as, as bad as this job is, um, I, I like, I, I think they're, I think they're going to be okay. Um, I kind of think, Pretty much any head coach in the MAC would be an upgrade over Les Miles. I mean, don't don't you like just? I, I know I'm not saying that 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 conference is super loaded with all these guys that are ready to be P5 head coaches, but don't you think almost like any of those guys would do? Uh, uh, well, would do, and also I think would have to be interested in it. I, I think, yeah, you, you know, I think a lot of times you look at a job like Kansas and think, my goodness, this is a dead end. Like, do I really want right. to take it? And if you're right. if you're a young coach who's well situated to have a good season next year, you may think, you know what, I'll pass on that. I got some other things I could work on down the road. But you know, in the MAC, where the top salaries, you know, I was looking at like like Lance Leipold is a name that's going to come up sure. a lot, and he's an experienced guy, Wisconsin Whitewater D three, but who has probably not gotten, an, in my opinion, enough looks from Power Five spots. Unless I was reading the chart wrong, I think he's only making about a half million a year, maybe a little more than that. So Lance Leipold from Buffalo and and Willie Fritz from from Tulane seem like the kind of guys that I would consider home runs for this. And and those are two guys, as you sort of alluded to two guys that, um, you know, over the past couple of years really have, have, I think not really gotten the looks they probably deserve for what they've achieved at their schools. And so while you could look at them and say, you know, like they could look at this and say, that's a mess. Maybe I wait till the end of the year to go try and, you know, chase a job. Maybe you've been through this a couple of years and it hasn't worked out. And maybe this is the opening that you've, not, it's not the one you've been waiting for, but maybe it's just time to take one of these. You know what I mean? So the one thing I would say with Fritz is when it goes back to the money situation, he will probably make about the same. Well, not about the same. He would definitely get a raise at Kansas, but like, I, you know, Kansas maybe pays him, you know, less was getting 2.75. And that was, you know, I think there was probably some money he was still trickling in from his. LSU buyout, so maybe they could get less a little bit of a discount. But let's just assume right, right. they would pay somebody what they're paying less. Well, I think Willie's making close to two million. So again, just from a money now, you're right. Willie's sixty years old. I think he he's yep. got Kansas roots. So maybe he just says, "Listen, uh, you know, this is my chance to get in the Power Five. This is sort of my retirement job. Either you know, I fix it and get you know a statue, or it doesn't work out and." You know, I, 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 I took my shot. Whereas with yeah. a guy like, so, so I think a guy like, like Fritz or just other 
coaches at the G5 level, especially in the AAC where they do pay fairly good money, I mm-hmm. think those guys are probably going to say, eh, maybe not. Correct. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and we've seen how, especially at the AAC, those jobs are truly, um, you know, they can they can launch you into, you know, much better jobs. So we're certainly not talking about um, some of those guys or, or uh, you know, Billy Napier, these guys that feel like they're on deck to be power five head coaches because they don't have to take this kind of job. You know, I, I wrote about it before the Les miles hire um, I, that I that I felt that Kansas needed to go find their Matt Campbell. Um, and I, I think that uh, and, and I, I wrote that at a time before Iowa State became what they became in 2020, you know, um, but, but I think the turnaround in Ames, I think kind of can be a shining example of what's possible at Kansas if they ever just like, you know, really put out these fires and, and get their act together. I mean, I think Kansas State under Bill Snyder is probably a more accurate comp just in terms of, uh, you know, the rock bottom status right now. Like it's not like Iowa State was ever this bad under Paul Rhodes, but um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, going and getting a proven builder who can actually recruit the Midwest, has connections, has a real competent strategy for how to get players to Kansas um, and can also just sort of create like a really good culture that that kids want to play for you and want to stay and, and all that. I, I think that's sort of the ideal. And, and look, the fact that we've seen now Iowa State, you know, go to a Fiesta Bowl and play for a big 12 title. And we've seen Kansas state, um, you know, reach these heights in, in Snyder's second tenure and stuff, um, and stay really competitive in a climb. And like, um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying Kansas can, you know, be a big 12 contender in the next five years, but we've seen in this conference, at least, um, you know, that, that if you get, if you get a real one, at least you have a chance to, to build back up and, and get back in the mix. And I think what we've seen at Iowa state, uh, while not a perfect comparison, does inspire. I, it should inspire a little bit of hope that if you can find the right guy, um, and and give them four or five years, you know what? It, what if something pretty cool could happen? Yeah, I do love the. I, I tend to like the idea of going younger, and as you said, find your Matt Campbell. I think I think that's hard, frankly. Yeah, um, yeah. But and because it's it's been such a mess. I would be inclined to looking for probably a little more experience and and just somebody so. who's got yeah. a, like some kind of a track record of hey I, I I've done it at a few places again that's why I mean again Leipold's name will come up uh, uh Jeff Monken's name will come up from Army there are some other good builders with a track record you mentioned Fritz and maybe a Sonny Dykes or somebody like that um Jay Norvell is a guy who probably has done a pretty nice job at Nevada though it's yeah. also been a relatively short period of time and you know, I don't know. You know, and, he, and, but again, and, he's and got and he's got ties to the Big guys Twelve. Here, do you, do you, how would you feel if they said, um, and I, again, this also comes down to who's making the hire. But if if they did go in the triple option direction, how would how would you how would you size that up? I mean, I know there's a lot of you know your colleagues at the at the athletics. I know Stuart Mandel has been banging the drum for. Hey, if you're a bad team, go triple option. Like I, I, like I don't think that's necessarily a terrible idea, but that's not why I'm hiring Jeff Monken. I'm hiring Jeff Monken because I believe he's got a vision and a plan, and and sort of can build a culture. Like I'm not really worried as much about the offenses and the like the the X's and O's part of it. And maybe I, I'm underrating that. I think what you know Kansas lacks is just sort of like you know, overall vision and structure and somebody to kind of come in and see the entire picture, link everything together, because that's what being a head coach really is. So you can say, oh, well, we're going to run option. And listen, that might work and that might be a cool like way to pivot and zig while everybody else is zagging. But I don't I don't think that's necessarily that's the key here. I think the key here is getting somebody in there who understands big picture and big picture and culture building and the fact that everything is connected and can work the boosters as well as, you know, figure out what is going on in the graphics department. Like literally has that, yeah. has a wide yeah. spectrum of skills and vision and the ability to right. delegate and hire smart people. Uh, so again, that's well, why, and, and that's t- why I'll I want someone this. with some experience. The comparison there. I made to Campbell, like I think back to, I, I, I when, when, 
Dave Beatty got fired. I called um, Jimmy Pollard at Iowa State and talked to him about the search he went through and, and asked for his thoughts on this opening in Kansas. And the thing he said was, you know, he, he had a list of five candidates and one of them was a triple option coach. Um, because he felt strongly that they they needed to do something different that that they uh, could not get anywhere by being the worst spread offense in the Big Twelve. You know what I mean? Like it just what what's the point of that? Why why try to compete with Oklahoma and everybody else with lesser parts? You know, uh, and do the same things as them. And so they felt uh, the pivot for them was um, playing great defense and running the ball. And and they've mm-hmm. done they've done exactly that at Iowa State. And so. Um, I, I, I kind of feel that way about Kansas too. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that Kansas needs to copy Iowa state, but I do think they need to, I think you're, you're right there that they need to figure out their thing that they can be really good at that makes them, uh, annoying to play on Saturdays, you know, and, and makes them different, a a different team to prepare for, um, than the rest of the teams in the league. And I'd also point out, um, they've really had, the worst quarterback play of any power five team over the last decade. Like that's really not debatable at all. And in 2020, they gave up more sacks per game than any team since 2000. So um, you've got to like, that's also like a pretty, pretty obvious objective. There is no matter what you're doing, you have to finally find a quarterback to build it around. And um, you know, if you go triple, I, you're going to like, you're going to watch some pretty ugly football here for the next couple of years. Cause it's, it's just going to be a process. You can't snap a finger and suddenly be good at that, you know? And so hopefully um, if they go that approach, they really support that, that head coach and their staff and have some patience, even when it's going to be rough in the first couple of years, because it is, that's a pretty serious facelift. Um, that's I think probably a lot harder than, um, then we probably uh, realize as, as fun as it is to sort of throw it out there as somebody needs to do it. So, hey, I got an idea. How about Bob Stoops for the next Kansas coach? <laughs> it's a little pivot. And a, and a, he, has, and a, he has valuable Big 12 experience. Uh, I will give you that. And, you know, this is just a, like just as we described this mess, Ralph, like as I think as you pointed out, like, look, I'm sure there's a lot of really, really talented um, up and coming coordinators and stuff out there, but this is this is just uh, 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 just such a mess, such a such a fire that is hard to put out. That I I do think it's probably going to take some experience, at least on this round, just to try and help get Kansas out of this hole a little bit and, and make this job one that uh, someday you could pass it off to a, a young up and comer here at some point. Right. Cause less had experience, but that's all less had. And it was just, it was, it was superficial because his plan was just to be less. And I bring up Stoops a, a because it was fun to do so and B, yeah. B, B to segue to the fact that he is now uh, sort of back in college football uh, as an analyst with, uh, with Fox's big noon kickoff. He replaces Urban Meyer. And, you know, Stoops' name has come up for several jobs over the last couple of years. Most famously and, and over the top uh, was how some Florida State fans were insistent that he was coming to be their next coach. Good deal. After, yep, that's right. After Willie Taggart was, uh, was fired there. And that has not ha- happened. You know, Stoops is only 60. He's seven years younger than Les Miles. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's nine years younger than Nick Saban, but there's always been this opinion with Stoops that like, you know, he's a guy who seemed to like, who always give the impression that he would really dig retirement, right? Like that he would, he would live a good life that he like, like sure he would miss it, but would he really miss it to that extent? You know, would he really miss it? Like he, you know, he, he's a guy who always seemed to find happiness in places that were away from football. Um, so, but when you move back into this position, it does sort of put you in place to be closer to the game, right? Literally closer to the game. You start talking yeah. to coaches more and you're just sort of involved in things and in the ecosystem a little more. It, it put Urban on deck to return. To coaching, though it wasn't to college coaching, it was to the NFL. And often coaches, you know, they, they do that. Okay. I'm going to go to TV for a year or two, see how that works out. And then kind of recharge the battery. Yeah. A little bit. And that yeah. launches me into a new job. Do you think this could be Stoops's reentry point that this could be his launching pad into a new job to sort of see how I'm feeling here? And then I'll survey the lay of the land and maybe get back into this. 
That's a great question. Um, I, I think clearly, first of all, there have been um, what we would, I think, all agree were big jobs. Um, Florida State being one of them. Auburn, I'm sure, uh, being one of them. Like, there have been big jobs that I'm sure have called Bob Stoops. And clearly the answer was nah. You know, clearly he was pretty happy with the life he was leading and um, not not dying to, to sort of throw himself and his family back into – uh, the pressure cooker of trying to, you know, compete for national titles at the highest level and all that. Now the, the XFL job he took in Dallas, um, I think probably is, is, is probably instructive. And just in the sense that I'm, I'm sure he saw that as, okay, this seems pretty fun. This seems pretty like, you know, low Chill. stakes, yeah. good fit for me, you know, like this, you know, and then when it, it when it, when it, uh, folds up i'm 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 sure that hurt him but it wasn't like tragic to him right like it's this is a fun thing i'm doing i, I got the itch again i want to be around players i want to coach and have some fun um i i think he he got into it a little bit and and, and i'm sure that was I'm, you know while the ending i'm sure it's frustrating I'm, I'm 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 sure that was like good for him so um i don't know i i, I think uh First of all, I, the, I think the dynamic switch there from from Urban Meyer to Bob Stoops on the Fox set will be interesting. Um, I think that uh, I think he probably you know will have like more of a sense of humor about this and 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 will will bring some of that like storytelling that 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 is really gold on that that format um, while also like joking around with those guys and like I, I I like I think I can see him being a fit for this and if he you know if he wants to try and do the Urban Meyer X and O breakdowns and stuff. Um, you know, I'm sure he could try to do that. Um, but I don't know, Bob, you know, I, I think the thing we, we, we can definitely say now after all these years is, uh, you know, Bob Stoops, uh, you know, his, I think his heart was in the right place when he, when he stepped down. I I think he, I, I can't imagine that's something that he has spent a ton of time second guessing when he, when he was ready to move on, he moved on and, he did so in a way that that uh, you know so few coaches in college football at the highest level actually get to do. So I don't know. I mean, I think Bob Bob's pretty damn happy with how this is all gone. It seems like, and so I'm I'm sure that's going to be really tempting to to get back into it and and really spend you know a few days a week uh, during the season really d- diving deep into college football again. But um, I'm sure it's going to make a lot of people want to hire Bob Stoops, but. I, you know, I think he's a pretty, pretty hard guy to, 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 uh, to sort of win over and, and, uh, you know, seduce back into coaching. Yeah. He had such a great situation. I mean, he had the same president and AD there for his entire tenure at Oklahoma. Uh, guys who were, you know, Joe Castiglione, the AD is super well respected. So yeah, he always had such a great, he had such a great gig. Right. He had one of the best gigs in all of college football. It was super stable. I, I, the other thing too with Stoops though, I will say this. So he, he clearly he could be one of these guys who's going to be super picky. And, and listen, if I'm, if I am going to come back, I want it to be a great job with, you know, somebody I can really trust to work for. And that's it. Like I'm not, I'm not dealing with any kind of second rate stuff here, but I will open the door to this. With Urban Meyer, the reason why I thought Urban would never go back to college, and maybe he will go back at some point, the reason why I didn't think Urban's next step would be back to college is, quite frankly, Urban standards were too high. Nobody, No job was going to... There's only only about three or four jobs in the country that would have even... Remotely, that he hasn't had yet. Yeah, yeah, right. interested Urban. He was not going to slum it in any way, shape, or form. And if you're not going to Texas and USC doesn't really want you, what is left, right? Unless you're going to go to LSU or Alabama or someplace like that. Um, yeah. So I always thought that would Notre eliminate Notre Dame's not opening up. Yeah, you're right. It's a really, it's a really short list of uh, of dream jobs there. Yeah. So I always thought that would eliminate Urban or or really limit the idea of Urban coming back with Stoops. You know, Stoops worked for Steve Spurrier, and I always go back to Spurrier when he came back from the NFL and went to South Carolina and talking about, you know, just want to do some things that have never been done before, right? That was his thing. We're going to do some things that have never been done before. And he took South Carolina because he knew, oh, if I, because at, at Florida, when I won 10 games, they said, what was wrong? But at South Carolina, if I win 10 games, I get a statue. And I mm-hmm. could see Stoops, maybe not necessarily going to Kansas, but I could <laughs> conceivably 
see a, a situation where, and I don't even know what the right, I mean, like you could throw names at me of what that job is. I'm not even sure what, but I could see Stoops going to a non-elite program where he feels comfortable with the leadership and sees an opportunity to sort of do his spurrier act. Like, I'm going to go in here. Yeah. I'm going to knock out a couple of really good seasons for this program, and they're going to love me to death. And I don't really have to win a national championship here because that's not what they do at this school. So I don't have that pressure, but I, you know, I can hit the, I can hit the targets that I can look for and maybe I'll ride that into my retirement. I, I mean, this is what made uh, UCF so sexy, right? When it opened up, it's quality of life and you've already got really good players there, you know? Right. Right. And so I can see, I wonder if that's maybe a possibility for Stoops. And of course, the interesting thing too on this is, you know, Fox tapes in Los Angeles, which means that they, you know, Stoops will be right down the road from USC. And of course, Clay Helton is always on the hot seat. So that will be, uh, we'll have another year of, of every time USC loses or stumbles, uh, will Bob Stoops maybe be the next guy at USC? Yeah, so that'll I, be some I, I interesting was drama. That. There. I, you know, we spent all of 2019. People people watched Big Noon kickoff being like, oh, what's he going to say about USC? Is he interested in that job? You know, is is this all uh, – is that kind of the end game here that Urban's trying to get USC or something, right? And then in 2020, as the season de- develops, then people are watching it being like, all right, does Urban want Texas? What's he going to say about Texas this week? Is that stuff real and all that? And, and I don't really think that's going to be the case with Bob Stoops on that show. Like I don't and, – and probably part of that is the way it ended for him, right? Like I think – if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're Urban Meyer, um, and the way the way things ended at Ohio State, I'm I, I'm I'm certain there was a, lo- a lot of motivation to get back out there and prove something. I'm, you know, we we mentioned it before, but Mac Brown, same thing, right? He he spends his time on TV, but after the way the bitter ending at Texas, there's a motivation to get out there and prove you still got it, right? And, and I, don't, I don't know that Bob necessarily like has a whole lot to prove to anybody at this point do you think do you no. think that's like a, a, a fire that burns for him I, I really don't know no i i don't i don't think he has that he because again he's never been that type of guy so that's that's a good point too right um you know if, a if he does want to take on a big job like he stepped away at, at a time when they they were rolling and had baker mayfield and everything and he was just like i'm good you know i'm good <laughs> yeah. thanks thanks everybody you know like yeah. <laughs> nobody nobody really does that and so i i feel like that's um you know maybe some you know this, this it's a weird business and jobs open up that you never think would open up so maybe some something perfect could come along someday that that would be uh just sort of check all the boxes for bob stoops and the way he wants to finish his career i i, I wouldn't rule that out because it's it's just a crazy enough sport but uh i, I don't know it's it, i'm sure for the uh executives at fox it's nice to know they they don't necessarily have to cross their fingers every week that Bob Suits might leave them at any moment, you know? Well, that and that's a good point, too. My last point on that, and then I'll say goodbye to you, Max, and let you get back to your little one there. Um, Right. I mean, maybe Bob Stoops is really good at this TV thing and he goes, Hey, this is not bad. This is a good life, right? I show up on right. Thursday, right. knock out a couple of rehearsals and way to go. I'm like in, you know, I'm back home by, by, you know, s- Saturday watching NFL games. Um, so, so that's not a bad life either. And I could very much see, you know, he's got the personality where maybe now, you know, again, you never know, but he's got the personality where maybe he is really good at this. Maybe he becomes, I don't know, maybe he's the next Lee Corso for all we know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Could be, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that, that show uh, builds around him. Obviously they built a uh, big noon kickoff completely around urban Meyer. That, that was the draw uh, on Saturdays to compete with college game day was come watch urban Meyer and, and come watch a show that, um, you know, is more invested in, in just real, uh, you know, X's and O's and coaching and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see how the, how the, uh, show sort of, uh, evolves around Bob, but I, I think he's going to have a lot of fun with it for sure. Max Olson from The Athletic, thank you so much for taking a little time out of your, uh, your paternity leave. Uh, good luck to you and your wife and little Theo. Uh, enjoy him. Yeah. Enjoy him. I know it can be a, a rough time as far as grabbing a little sleep, but it's also, I, I know, a really fun time to have, uh, to be a parent. So again, good luck with everything and thanks so much for joining me today. You know, I, I didn't get as much sleep today as I'd hoped, but hopefully hopefully this was still 
uh, a, a competent conversation, my man. I, pre- I appreciate you having me. You were still on point. Thanks, Max. Thanks. Hey, all podcast consumers. Rich Eisen here. So often, aspiration comes from inspiration, with titans of industry being those torchbearers. With guests from the world of news, business, sports, and entertainment, my new show is going to give you their most in-depth firsthand stories that focuses on the humble beginnings and humbling moments that we can relate to in our own lives. The podcast is called Just Getting Started with me, Rich Eisen. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. And now three and out. First down. Last word on my interview with Charles Huff from Marshall. We talked about how the herd was coming off a solid season, though there is some retooling to do. A glance at Bill Conley's returning production numbers has Marshall way down around 112 in the country. Now that could change as Bill adds up some super seniors and transfers. The herd should get a boost along the offensive line where they could have as many as four super seniors and second team All-American Blaine Madden back. But I think the reason for optimism and why it looks like a good landing spot for Huff is fundamentals, foundation and competition. Marshall is not quite a plug and play program, but there is a track record of success that appears to be repeatable and somewhat stable. Compare that to the rest of Conference USA, which is anything but these days. Second down, credit to college football reporters Brian Fisher and uh, my friend Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic for the reporting update on the one-time transfer exception. I've been telling you for a while that folks in college sports were hopeful, very hopeful, that the delayed NCAA legislation related to transfers would get back on track by late April. The legislation was paused along with the NIL changes back in January because of a Department of Justice inquiry. The two issues are not directly related, so the hope was that the NIL could still be up in the air, but the transfer rules should not be, that they could be worked out. But if the NCAA can't move on a full legislative package for transfer rules, Nicole and Brian reported that a waiver could be passed to allow all transfers to immediately be eligible this season. Consider it a short-term solution and a bridge to a permanent fix. So if you're wondering if your team's tantalizing transfer will be eligible this season, if the NCAA can't get around to passing new rules, the highly likely answer is yes. Third down, Indiana gave Tom Allen a million dollar raise to nearly five million per year earlier this week. Two things on this. First off, I had a typo in my tweet about the news called the coach Tim Allen, which led to a little Twitter fun for some folks. So I'm glad I provided a little humor to your day. Second, I have a controversial opinion on this that has developed by watching the Purdue Jeff Brom relationship over the last couple of years. I don't know if it makes sense for a school to spend really big money on a coach for a low ceiling football program that would need something close to a miracle to even win a conference title. You can say that's a defeatist attitude, but I'd counter that I don't need to pay Michigan prices to get the best out of a program that doesn't have the resources, access to talent, or history of success to suggest that it can regularly crack eight wins. I guess the argument would be you're not paying to raise the ceiling at a place like Indiana or Purdue as much as to lift the floor of the program, and that makes some sense. Still, though, you know, I'm not an economist, but I can't help but think that pouring big money into a small business doesn't mean that business will become a Fortune 500 company. Maybe Allen will prove me wrong, but I suspect in a couple of years, his resume will look a lot like Brahms if he does stay at Indiana. Both are good coaches, but college football programs generally don't surpass their historical levels without some kind of landscape shifting event like desegregation or mass influx of population to the state of Florida and across the Sun Belt. 
I know Indiana and Purdue want to act like they are competing with the best of the Big Ten, but no matter how much they spend on their coaches, they're probably not going to, and that goes for a whole bunch of mid to lower tier Power Five programs who are emboldened these days by the big revenues being generated by TV deals to spend lavishly for coaches who might not make that big of a difference in your final results. That is the show for today. I'd like to thank my producer, Sarah McCrory, for making me sound good. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Westwood One Podcast. Please subscribe so you do not miss an episode. If you have a question that you'd like me or my guests to answer, email them to aptop25mailbag at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you on all topics, college football, serious or silly. That's aptop25mailbag at gmail.com. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. Thanks for listening and come back for more next week of the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast.